Hello, welcome back everyone to Knights of the Dirty Table. I am your host, struggling actor Merrick Henry. And for our next segment, we are going to be talking about my personal MCU ranking of all 23 films. We are leaving no stone unturned. Um, every film in the franchise, in my opinion, is not bad by any stretch. It ranges from good to really good to great to excellent to cinematic perfection. And these are just things that are good to me, film-wise. Um, this, this is just my own personal list. No one else has weighed in. I'm sure everyone else on behind the curtain is good to have their opinions of my ranking, but that's fine. I've been dying to get this list out from the moment we started this show, and gosh darn it, I'm gonna do it right now. Um, villains and antagonists play a key role into my rankings for this, just so everyone understands. It comes down to good hero development, how good is the story, and are the villains as good as the heroes, because in most good films, your villain has to be as good as your hero. So let's get started. Barney's gonna hate me for this one. At the bottom, I do have, in fact, Thor The Dark World. Ha! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, most people will have Hulk here, and there there he is. Uh, and we'll, we'll have Ghost Dan and Jemmy here in just a little bit. That's okay. Can't wait to have you on, bud. Um, most people are gonna have Hulk here at the bottom of the list because of how much it doesn't really impact the overall universe i just feel like this has the weakest villain it's a waste of a doctor the ninth doctor played the villain in this movie and he was just so underutilized wayne's throwing his hands up in the air because he agrees it's garbage um and loki was originally yeah. supposed to die in this movie and that would have been really sucky that would have been a terrible way to end the movie they changed it afterwards in reshoots because loki was doing so well in avengers they said this is going to be a mistake nobody's actually going to believe that he's dead so let's just bring him back and save him for the future what a great save i mean the dynamic between thor and loki is really enjoyable and while it's definitely on the bottom of the list for me loki still for me saves the movie and makes it incredibly enjoyable to watch so i would watch it again for that alone moving on up number 22 everyone else's bottom i have the incredible hulk here uh, it's an absolute improvement over the previous Hulk film that came out five years prior, Ang Lee's Hulk. Um, but it's still a little stale when compared to all the other movies in the franchise. It's an average hero. The antagonist performances from General Ross and Abomination are so-so. It's not terrible, but it, we've gotten better since then, so I have to mark it down just for that. Um, how they brought in Tony Stark really kind of, for me, makes the film watchable and makes it relevant to the universe. I want to see more of General Ross in future uh, MCU installments. We're getting our She-Hulk series coming up soon, and I'm hoping that's going to be our way of telling great Hulk stories without having the legal ramifications of not being able to make a Hulk movie. So hopefully we can get all these Hulk supporting characters and we can just get Red Hulk because that's all I want for Christmas is Red Hulk in the MCU. Moving on up, number 21, Iron Man 2. Uh, the first time that we really got proof of, a, uh, of an Avengers story really being in the works. Jack is judging me on so many fronts. That's okay. That's fine. Um, I mean, the movie exists to, for me, essentially establish War Machine as a hero, and that sells me the movie just outright. I'm a huge War Machine fan. Everyone is just losing their minds backstage. This is remarkable. I love this controversy here on You Nights. did this on purpose. You betcha oh, I did. I'm I very like proud DC of it. better. Um, and having Black Widow in as part of this movie also really, um, it's a really great way to establish her character. We're all super stoked for the Black Widow movie coming up. The trailer dropped uh, a couple weeks ago at the point of this video, and it looks great. I'm so stoked. I'm glad she's finally getting her movie. Uh, it feels weaker than many other films in the overall franchise, but I feel like it's still enjoyable for a standard action hero sequel. So it's still a cut above many other films for me. At number 20, ooh, Barney, don't judge me. I have Thor. I know. I have um, Thor. Uh, yeah, I know. Ooh. I, I, I am breathing is this in. this guy for real? I'm breathing in the controversy. Is this This guy is wonderful. For I real? feed off your pain. Um, the light humor here for me is good. And Chris Hemsworth really establishes himself as a great leading actor and being able to lead films um, in many other projects and such. And it's really a great vehicle for him. Um, it's really good at establishing what Asgard is and the world building that takes place within it and how different it feels from the first three films overall in the franchise, you know, Iron Man, Incredible Hulk, Iron Man 2, up to this point. And Tom Hiddleston is good in the movie, but I mean, when you look at it compared now, he's only just getting started with his performance. Obviously, he's gonna be able to take the character into whole new territories, but it's a really good way to introduce yourself to the mythical side of the MCU. 
So I'm glad that we were able to get better performances down the line from both Chris Hemsworth and Tom Hiddleston. At number 19, Barney will be thankful for this one. I have Captain America, the first Avenger at number 19. Uh, for me, the film has aged better in recent years with all these films that have come out displaying all of Cap's arc and all of, he still hates it either way. He calls him crapped in America and I strongly disagree. Um, all, all of Cap's journey was able to stay in put thanks to the writers from the first Captain America movie being put into the second Cap film and the third Cap film and also Infinity War and Endgame. So his story has been pretty united kind of from beginning to end, which is really nice. Um, the reveal of Red Skull's face is still one of the creepiest things I've ever seen, but I love it because Red Skull is a creepy character. For me, the highlight of the movie is Agent Carter. I think she's, um, I think it's an incredibly strong performance for, for a comic book movie of this time period. Um, Haley Atwell really delivers in the role, and it's nice to see a strong female character really help drive a lot of events for me in the movie. So I watch it again for that alone. The film holds a very special place in my heart. It's, so it's not really about the film in this case. It's about the post credits. Nothing will be more magical than seeing the Avengers uh, trailer at the end of Captain America 1, seeing proof that this film was getting made. So that's kind of why I have it on the lower end, because it's really the post credit scene that I hold in my heart, and it's just a trailer. So give and take. Uh, here's some controversy. Uh, number 18, I have Captain Marvel. The recent film that came out in 2019 made a billion dollars, was incredibly successful. It feels like a phase one film. And in some ways it's good, and in some ways it's not so good. I think it's actually clever for feeling like a phase one film since it's set in the 1990s and takes place before Iron Man and takes place after Captain America 1. So I think it fits nicely and feels like it should be a part of that universe. We just have all this awesome info now for all these characters like Coulson and Nick Fury that we get to see play out in all these other films. Um, it's a great backstory for Nick Fury. Um, I think he's actually the shining part of the movie for me. I personally wish that we actually got more Carol Danvers. Um, I'm a fan of the portrayal that Brie Larson has given for Captain Marvel. I just would like a little more Captain Marvel in my Captain Marvel movie. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. But that's kind of why I have it on the lower end of the list. It's a great supporting cast film, but it's not as much of a wonderful Captain Marvel film. I'd like to see more of her as she leads moving forward. Um... I, I think I also kind of, as we've talked in previous segments, kind of hype culture and stuff, I really wanted an original Captain Marvel, the male Marvel, put into the film. But I was okay with what they did with Annette Benning's character and making her Marvel and kind of changing that a little bit to kind of take the themes and fit it more into modern times. That didn't bother me as much, but I wanted kind of two Captain Marvels. Oh, well. Moving on. Number 17, I have Ant-Man. I love heist movies. I'm a big fan of every Oceans movie. Um, all of them. Um, it's a great cast. I have Paul Rudd as kind of perfect casting. When I first heard the announcement, it kind of just made perfect sense. The fact that they could get Michael Douglas into this movie um, is just a huge win because you have such a legendary actor from iconic films and he's able, he's willing to play ball with a hero that shrinks down to the size of an ant. I never thought I'd see kids I, my side job as of right now is Chuck E. Cheese. And sometimes during Halloween, I see kids come in in superhero costumes and nothing was cooler to me than seeing a kid come in as Ant-Man. Never did I think I'd be alive to see the day when a kid wanted to go out and buy a $40 Ant-Man costume from their local Halloween shop and wear it around in public. It's a great day for superhero -dom. Uh, Moving on, I have number 16, just slightly above, I have Ant-Man and the Wasp, which I think is a slight improvement over the first Ant-Man movie. Uh, mainly because Evangeline Lilly just crushes it as Wasp. She's strong. She's quick on her feet. Um, and she takes no crap from nobody. And I just... The mid credit scene also will always gut-wrench me anytime I see it as it plays into Infinity War. So that's kind of why I have it slightly above Ant-Man is because of, its, of how it plays into other films. But I just still think it's a slightly better film than Ant-Man. Maybe it's just me. Uh, after that, number 15, I have Iron Man 3. This film also has aged better for me now that I've been, you know, a few years comfortable with the idea that the Mandarin is not, in fact, the Mandarin. Luckily, we're fixing that with um, Shang-Chi coming up, but that's a conversation for another time. Um, the movie takes a lot of risks with Shane Black at the director's helm over Jon Favreau from the previous two installments, and they try new things, and it feels different, and... You know, it, it doesn't feel like the first or second film at all. I feel like it was a good Iron Man story um, after seeing Tony's character fight off aliens in the Avengers. Uh, it just, 
it feels like a really good sci-fi adventure, not sci-fi, um, a sp uh, kind of sci-fi spy epic. I wouldn't quite know how to describe it, but it, it feels like it's in a good spot to be like in the middle of the pack, given how many films we've gotten since then. Uh, number 14, a lot of people are going to have this film much higher than I do. I have Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1, and it has a wonderful different kind of humor that we hadn't seen in the MCU prior, and it was certainly welcomed. I just, for me, Ronan is like the second weakest villain in the whole franchise, just slightly above Malekith from Thor The Dark World. Um, I never thought I would be around to see a talking tree a space raccoon and you know a ragtag bunch of heroes actually be a successful film franchise but i'm really happy that we could take these c-list characters and make them household names um it feels it feels like a standard origin story and i was happy to see it i actually saw it the first night with barney um and we both really enjoyed it i was just more excited to find out what else these characters can do when you're not setting up all of these different aspects of the cosmos for the marvel cinematic universe so that's why i have it a little up lower it feels like a standard origin story and i was more excited for the next adventure rather than the one that was right in front of me uh right above that number 13 i have dr strange it's an iron man copycat but i don't care it's still awesome um same for guardians one it was an origin story and i was more excited for the characters afterwards but i have it slightly above because um, it does a really good job at showing all the different realities that exist within the MCU, not just the main reality that we're in front of. You know, the mirror dimension I thought was really cool, and the execution for that was really great. Um, what One thing that they've done, that the MCU has done with Doctor Strange, is they've started putting him in other movies. They put him in Thor Ragnarok and both recent Avengers movies, and I think those appearances only help his sequel coming out in 2021, and I think the movie's going to financially be bigger than the first film, strictly because we got more of Doctor Strange from these other films to establish his character even more around these other characters. So I'm very, I'm more excited for a sequel than I was to see the first one, but they delivered and it was fun. Uh, next, number 12, I have the first film to start it all. I have Iron Man 1. It's a classic. It's good on its own without any of the sequels, without, if you didn't know that it was part of a bigger universe and you just watched Iron Man as it is, it's really fun. You get strong performances from RDJ, who had his magnificent career comeback based on this movie. You had Jeff Bridges, who played a wonderful uh, Obadiah Stane, in my opinion. He was very intimidating. Um, you have a strong sense of realism, considering that this film was made in 2008, and around that time you had the Iraq War going on. It felt very real, even as a kid seeing in the movie theater. I felt like I could see the, the uh, relations between the comic book movie and the real world that was going on. So I, I enjoyed that even as a kid, even though I kind of didn't really know much else going on with the war. At that point, uh, it was a surprise hit. I only knew about, I knew about the character from the 90s series because I had watched it on TV and I loved that, but I knew that he was a B-list character. Not everybody know, knew about him. But the fact that we were able to take this B-list character and make him a household name is kind of a credit to the whole team for making this film as wonderful as it is and starting us off on this wonderful franchise. So kudos to you. Above that, another Iron Man uh, film, but not quite an Iron Man titled one. I have Spider-Man Homecoming at number 11. Uh, there's a lot of heart in this movie, and uh, Tom Holland just delivers. The entire cast does. Michael Keaton as well as Vulture. Oh, man, what a surprise. I thought that was going to be a sucky villain. I was wrong. Um, I mean, Spider-Man's a great character on his own, and we've seen him do great in other films separate from this franchise. Uh, but this film really showed how wonderful Spider-Man can be when you have him interact with other characters in the Marvel Universe that aren't just Spider-Man characters. Um, and it also helped that this really wasn't an origin film because we already kind of knew what happened to his his life prior to becoming Spider-Man. So we didn't have to rehash that again. So because of that, it gets a slight uh, upper hand for me because it's not an origin story. At number 10, I do have Thor Ragnarok at number 10. Uh, it's incredibly funny. It's a great vehicle for um, Hulk to be outside of the Avengers movies because legally you couldn't make a solo film on his own because Universal has the rights to him. Um, it highlights Chris, Hemsworth com Chris Hemsworth's comedic talents a lot. I first saw those on display in Ghostbusters 2016, which I actually do think is a good movie and very underrated, but I understand why it didn't move forward with sequels. That being said, he was incredibly funny in that. He's incredibly funny in this. Uh, the movie feels like Thor meets Guardians of the Galaxy, and I feel like it was exactly the shakeup that was needed um, to revitalize the franchise and bring Thor into a strong solo spotlight 
rather than just seeing him in the Avengers films and be a really good supporting cast, supporting cast character to everyone else involved. Uh, moving on at number nine, I have this film above Guardians 1, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. I feel like it's, for me, it's better because it's just not an origin story. That's really all I asked for. Um, the, all the characters, all the actors got to play in the sandbox and really just utilize strong emotions. Um, I was really big fans of what Yondu did, Nebula did, an Ego um, with Kurt Russell. I really enjoyed those performances, and Chris Pratt really delivered when he needed to in regards to his dad ego and it it was nice to see him really play with that emotion and really let out that aggression that's secretly been building up for so long um i mean it's not as impactful as say the first film like kind of it's just like a, it feels like a side quest like not as much happens for the characters um but i still just think that everyone plays better on screen than the first film because we're not setting up as much story elements we can just let everybody play at number eight a lot of people are going to have this one higher i don't for Somewhat odd reasons. I have Black Panther at number eight. Um, it is definitely culturally significant on its own, and it's an incredible achievement in its own right for filmmaking. It is meant to be, an, it deserves to be an absolute phenomenon for what it was. Um, seeing all new kinds of people come to the movie theater that had never seen a Marvel film before pop out for this film, uh, it was really incredible to see in person. It's a strong cast of characters. It's got an incredible message from both the hero and the villain. So you can't decide really who's right or wrong, depending on which way you look at it. And I love that. Um, a big reason why I don't have this necessarily in my top as most others do is because I just am a sucker for team up films. It's really just a matter of personal preference. Black Panther checks off a lot of boxes. I just like, I like my characters playing with each other. That's all. Speaking of team ups at number seven, a lot of people would have this one lower. I have Avengers Age of Ultron. And reason, I know I hear the chuckles behind the camera. It's fine. <laughs> um, it's higher. Mine's higher on the list. Um, it's ultimately just because of preference. I mean, everyone plays well together. It's definitely the weakest of the Avengers films, kind of no question, but I'm just a big fan of James Spader as an actor, and he was really fun for me as Ultron, and he's one of my favorite MCU films just because of that performance alone. It does. It also feels like a side quest rather than an impactful universe moment um, for the Avengers, but it's still fun to watch, and if it's ever on TV, of course I'm going to just drop everything what I'm doing and watch it. Speaking of more team ups, one that is that definitely feels like more of an improvement over Age of Ultron, I have Captain America: Civil War, Avengers 2.5. Um, it's definitely a better movie than Age of Ultron. Uh, the villain plot for me feels just a little muddled, but more rewatches over time has helped me kind of settle into what um, uh, Zemo was looking to do as an antagonist to the Avengers. The airport scene is absolute perfection, so that already shoots it high above uh, many other films for me. That whole sequence is fantastic. And seeing Tony and Cap uh, go at each other's necks with their political beliefs and how they feel about superherodom, um, it's really great to watch, and it's just really strong. And also, Bucky and Cap's reunion from Winter Soldier prior, um, it really plays well in this movie, I feel like, so it felt like a great conclusion to that friendship arc. Um, now into my top five, I have Spider-Man Far From Home. To me, the best Spider-Man movie ever made. The stakes, I know I'm hearing the booze. Stakes are what? really high. Who's booing that? Wayne, Wayne's booing it on the side. That's okay. Best live action. Yeah, you could argue it's the best live action one, no question. You can hear, we, we can talk about Into the Spider-Verse another time. But um, the stakes are really high for our hero going up against Mysterio, and it plays really well. That whole uh, dream sequence with Mysterio's tech was just so incredible. I never saw anything like that. Um, it really- 100% CG. <laughs> it Remarkable, huh? Amazing. It ties really well into the MCU as a whole, taking plot elements for all the way from Iron Man 1 and dropping them into this, dropping them from Civil War and putting it into that, and it felt like a real MCU movie. Kind of more so than, than Captain Marvel. Like, everything was highlighted in a lot of ways. And it was just, it was a really fun uh, adventure to see it. It plays so well post-Endgame that this was exactly what we needed coming out of that. Much of a palate cleanser. Kind of the same way that Ant-Man and the Wasp was for Infinity War. Uh, but this one's a better palate cleanser, in my opinion. Um, it shows that Spidey is still Marvel's best and most relatable hero because of the struggles that he faces in this movie. And that's why I have this in my top five. Uh, number four, this was my number two for a long time, but of course, more films come out, things change. Captain America, The Winter Soldier at number four. This film showed me how Cap is supposed to be. 
um, how he's supposed to work in today's modern storytelling. Uh, Chris Evans turns in an absolutely fantastic performance, in my opinion, as Cap, um, especially right before he enters the helicarrier and he's about to engage in that. And he's talking to all the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents to say, like, you have a choice today. You can either choose Hydra or you can choose Freedom. And that, to me, just, it really hit home. And that's why I try to live some of my life as what would Captain America do? I look up to Chris Evans' performance in that aspect. It really stayed with me for a lot of reasons. And on top of that, I mean, the plot twists with Hydra were absolutely crazy. It's it's the follow-up that I was looking for after Avengers 1 that Iron Man 3 and Thor The Dark World didn't quite deliver on for me with overall world post-aliens falling down from the sky and attacking everybody in New York. Speaking of the Battle of New York, at number three, I have Marvel's The Avengers. Uh, the film was game-changing. Um, this changed my life. It showed me what superhero movies could really do. Um, it was incredible to see everybody together. The cast is awesome. And the only there's only minor problems with Hawkeye just not being featured enough, but he gets featured more in other films, and he has a show coming up, so I don't have to feel as bad anymore, so it's fine that he kind of takes a backseat to literally everyone else in the cast. <laughs> um, so, but before this movie... Um, there's every film before this movie with all the other Phase One films, and there's every film that came afterwards where this, where the measure of success really just changed from a creative standpoint to a financial standpoint. It it blew my mind pretty much. Staying with the Avengers theme at number two, I have Avengers Infinity War. Right before um, the plot that takes place right before Endgame, um, it delivered on its promise from Avengers One, with Thanos coming in and proving to be a real threat. Uh, delivered incredibly. Uh, he's clearly the best villain in the MCU. I don't even think it's a question. Maybe you could argue Loki, but it's kind of 50-50 for most. It's incredibly well-paced. It showcases every single character that's featured in the movie. Everyone has a chance to shine for either strong bits of character arc or brief moments. It just feels like a nice culmination of story at that point. Um, and it really hurts sitting around for a whole year waiting to find out what happened after the snap to all these characters. So sitting... For a year after seeing it in the movie theater, oh, just gut-wrenching. And Tom Holland needs award recognition for his performance in that when he's falling to death in Tony's arms. Give him all the awards. And finally, speaking of snapping away to dust, my number one, to no one's surprise on anybody on anybody's list here, uh, it's Avengers Endgame. Uh, it's cinematic perfection. It's the greatest film ever made. Um, it was bigger than Infinity War, and I didn't even think that was possible to get bigger than Infinity War. I know, Dan Dan and Jimmy's ready, ready to chime in in just a moment. We'll get him in. Um, it honored, as a, with Infinity War, it honored all the story that came before. Endgame honored the filmmaking that came before, and I didn't even think that was a possible thing to do. Um, it's a cinematic euphoria. There, there's I could go in with all kinds of adjectives that I read in the Webster Dictionary before starting the segment, but it's just... It's the best film ever.